Hello and welcome to lab 10 over fossils. Fossils are the keys and clues to understanding the types of depositional environments that existed in geologic past once we had life forms. So we put that in context with rock layers and all the things you've learned about for the three different rock types. So you can see a trilobite on the left that's just like my necklace here, clue. <laughs> And then you see Mammoth W over here on the right from the Mammoth site in Waco, which is a national monument. You need to have read your chapter reading in the book and watch the lecture video from start to finish. Those two tools are absolutely critical. And there's a third tool you're gonna need. In the lab folder, there is a document, it's a PDF that is a an identification tool, for better lack of words, that I had someone put together years ago. And it's very, very good. Now, there's no discernible order of like the files being alphabetized, anything like that. So you're going to have to thumb through it, look through it. And the idea is that we're not trying to get to any kind of species level, family. We're just trying to get to a biome. That's really all we're trying to do. And second thing is, preservation tends to be something that students have a, a more challenging time with in these labs. While I think it's important, it's really beyond the scope of you having to identify everything with the preservation, but it's a good habit to start with. So we'll begin that process. And I'll try to help you with that as we go through this. So you can see there's a theme. There's a common way that vertebrate fossils tend to be preserved more commonly. Uh, for invertebrates, it looks like this and so forth. So, you know the drill. <laughs> there is a list of fossils and it is a little overwhelming. I'm going to tell you flat out in your chapter and in your lab, there's no way we can cover every single one of these fossils. It's impossible. So, there are semester-long courses, even year-long courses, that deal with nothing but like vertebrate paleontology, invertebrate paleontology. That is not what we're here to achieve. We're here to give you an overview and get you some experience. So if you do see these things out in nature, you'll have a basic idea of making con the connection between, okay, well, it would have lived in this kind of environment. This is probably what it is. That's the whole spirit and intent. So you're gonna get out the one bag you've not identified yet, which is a section 10 lab known as fossils. You're gonna get out your fossil equipment, but the only things I'm gonna tell you you don't need is all of the above. You don't need these to test fossils. In fact, it's mean and cruel and unusual punishment to do this to ancient living organisms. So we don't get this kind of stuff out. What I am gonna ask is that you get just a nice smooth napkin or paper towel that you can set these things on because we wanna be respectful of ancient life forms. Please, no acid, no testing for hardness, no streaking, none of that's necessary for fossils. Okay, gonna have a quick review because Cast and moles are types of trace fossils you'll see in this lab. And, you know, I talked about this in lecture, but basically a cast is, if this is, um, this is man-made, by the way, we made plaster and smushed a real shell into it to make a mold. And then we filled the shells up with what would be like mud in real life uh, in after death. And that's the cast. So you need to make sure you know the difference between a cast and a mold because they both are important in our journey today. And quick overview of the preservations. Most all of the marine fossils you'll look at are recrystallized. That means that they have retained their original family of composition. They didn't get replaced, but that can happen on a rare occasion. But this is how you're gonna see a majority of our fossils done today. Replacement, this is a coprolite, and uh, so basically poo. And it is fairly heavy because it's been replaced with iron. So if that's the case, it's changed its original compound that it was made out of, obviously. So uh, that's replacement. Permineralization is a very common way, especially for teeth and bones. Uh, for phylum chordata to get preserved, and basically it takes the pore spaces that are 
in the fossil and transforms them into rock. Petrification uh, occurs in plants, and essentially this is where you have the uh, cellular wall and internal cellular material replaced, and they can come in certain degrees of changes, and like this is actually petrified wood, and so is this. You're like, well, I think that's better, and of course it's prettier and it's worth more money, but this is same thing. It's petrified wood. It's just the amount of minerals in the groundwater saturation to that in terms of being in the optimal geologic conditions to create what you see in the right. Carbonization is when you have an organic element such as a, a fish or a bug or something small that gets trapped in, um, in mud and it leaves a carbon imprint. And after all the volatile stuff is gone and vaporizes, you're left behind with the exact morphology of what um, was decaying in that material. All right, we do need to talk about subfossils because it's possible you could have that in your lab where you have a fossil that exhibits absolutely no preservation. And there could be several reasons for that. One, it's very young. Um, and so you will see that very young fossils may not have been altered yet, like the mammoth tooth on the right. Or you could have uh, something for a cast or a mold that has absolutely no preservation whatsoever because it's just rock material. So it just didn't have a chance to do that. All right, so get out your samples and line them up one through 10. And again, we are going to phylum for anything that's an, an animal type organism. If it's a plant, we're just gonna go with kingdom because plants are so prolific in the fossil record once we start getting them that we could do nothing but talk about that for the rest of the semester and then some. So we're gonna identify if it's a body or a trace, then we're gonna identify if it is a trace, what type is it that you think it might be and give a shot at identifying preservation. So the very first one you have, I want you to pull it out and I'm not gonna do all of this for you. I'm gonna make you kind of go through the process. So it's really good to kind of get a master list of the phylums uh, that I talked about in lecture that were very common and kind of get them there. And a couple that I might throw out that uh, you'll see more of, uh, you'll see lots of phylum mollusca that has things like gastropods, uh, cephalopods, which are like the ammonites. You're going to have lots of mollusks, which are bivalves, pelecipods. They're, they're seashells, okay? And when we get into arthropods, you could have a variety of those. Every kind of insect is a, a an arthropod. Uh, anything that's segmented, like crabs, bees, trilobites, <laughs> things of that nature, those are all arthropods. Then you're going to have lots of echinodermata or echinoderms. Those are animals that are exclusively marine that have five-fold symmetry. Things like crinoids and blastoids and um, things like uh, sand dollars or, or any kind of sea urchin. So let's uh, start with sample one and pull it out. And the first thing you wanna ask, is it a body or a trace? And you can actually feel the material, the shell, I mean, I, I have the samples in front of me and I can feel them and they are definitely body fossils. And this does have a preservation. It has been recrystallized, so it's a lot tougher than you would have found it if you would have been on the beach walking and collected it. So what phylum would that be? So if it's a seashell, I'm gonna help you with this one. It would fall under phylum mollusca. Then you gotta determine which of the three majors is it. Now there's a lot more than the three majors under mollusca. Uh, so basically gastropods, cephalopods, and bivalves. Which one of these would that fall under? And that's what you've got, okay? For the second one, I need to pull it out. I know it's really pretty. And the reason uh, it is, is it's been polished. But this sample came from Morocco and pretty cool indeed. And many of their uh, fossils like this have been polished up and really nice. And so when you look at it, you're gonna need to flip in that book that I, I gave you, the PDF, and start looking for something that has the same morphology. So that's how you use that book. You're looking for things that have the same shape and that can help you put it in the right phylum. 
So when you do that, I'm going to tell you this is a body fossil to try to help you out with that. And it is definitely in one of the phylums that's in that book. So keep looking and you'll be good to go. Now, it's been recrystallized. That's actually the color of the mud. And it's been polished up so you can kind of see the black and the rest of the organism that's there. So it's a recrystallized fossil. As you look at sample three, I know it may look small, but I want you to pull it out and touch it and see the different sections that make up your thing that you have without giving it away. And thumb through the book and see if you find something that looks like it. Now, this has bifold symmetry. That should help you put it in the right category of phylums because there's another phylum that has something that looks similar but it's not in the bifold symmetry one. And then this is, for a term, a stalk rather than the actual whole thing. So when you look at it, you'll go, yeah, I see that. And you'll know exactly what it is. And again, we're going to phylum. So for example, for this one, are you looking at phylum arthropoda, mollusca, periphera, Nidaria, are you looking for uh, phylum echinodermata? Are you looking for uh, so forth, such as uh, chordata? Which one is it? That's what you're trying to identify, and that's what I'm going to be asking you predominantly on the assessment. So that's what you're trying to aim for. This particular one's been uh, preserved as recrystallization. Moving on to sample four. When you look at sample four, I need you to get it out and really look at it, get a light on it, because when you do, you'll begin to see that the organism has made levels and grew a section of its little house, its, or its shelly material, and you'll be able to see that. And when you do, there is a picture in your, uh, or your PDF that looks just like this, and you'll be able to determine which one it falls in. It's been recrystallized, it's a body fossil, it's the real mill deal, and uh, these are very common in the Central Texas area. Matter of fact, beyond that, they're very common for a certain period of time, especially during the Mesozoic, and particularly the end of the Mesozoic and the Cretaceous period. I get out sample five and uh, touch it and look at it, and notice that it appears that it, it's a different color than everything you've seen thus far. That's important because so get out sample five and notice that the color is different than anything you've seen thus far. That's important because it's been replaced, okay? And it is indeed a trace fossil, not a body fossil. That's another clue. And when you think about what it is, go back and look at your chapter, go back and even look at the beginning of this video and your lecture video, you'll see something that looks like it. And then you'll know what you're dealing with. And uh, then think about why it's a trace fossil. So again, it's been replaced, it's a trace fossil, which phylum is the responsible party for producing what you have. All right, get out sample six. That is just like this right there, okay? And this is a body fossil, and I want you to take a peek at it and understand that they came in all different shapes and sizes back when they were alive, but these things are long gone and extinct. Matter of fact, most of everything that you're seeing uh, in the animals that produced them are extinct. There may be some that are similar and alive today, the original stuff is long gone. And what you're pretty much left behind with is the mud that filled up the cavities of this segmented animal. That's a big clue right there. And in doing so, you could argue, is this a body or a trace? So I'm not gonna get really hung up on that, but um, really err on the side of it being a trace fossil more than a body fossil, but it is, a very good example of one. This is clearly a body fossil of that particular organism. And when you see it, I want you to think about which 
phylum has all the segmented animals, and that's where this one falls. So what's its preservation? If it were like this one, it would be recrystallized. In this particular case, you're looking at mud. So it has no fossilization of preservation. All right, now get out sample seven. And when you get to seven, I need you to look at it and you know, you're pretty good now at thumbing through your PDF and find something that looks like this. You're looking for things that look like they have kind of branches. And the size of the holes in the branch make a difference. So I want you to get some kind of magnification on that and tell me if they're little tiny, tiny openings or big openings, or if the openings tend to have individual cavities in them or little animals would have lived as colonies. Because if that's the case, it's, uh, that would be a cnidarian, a coral. If it has big, giant openings, big ones, then that would be, uh, you'd be looking at periphera, which are sponges. And if it has tiny little pinpoint type ones, then you're looking at a bryozoan. So that's important because each one lives a different way in the marine environment. And that's why they're made a little bit differently. But they all have the function of feeding or filter feeding in the water to get stuff out of it to eat. Get out sample eight, and I know it's tiny, but it's a fabulous sample, and it's half of one, actually. And these things are index fossils throughout the Mesozoic, and most famously for the Cretaceous period. And they look like cinnamon buns, so get in your identification book and you'll find one that looks just like this. And remember, we're going to phylum. So which phylum has the animals like this with the chambers, not segments, chambers? And this one uh, was a predator during its lifetime. It is fully recrystallized as an FYI, and it's a body fossil, no doubt. All right, number nine, if you'll get that out and look at it. So this is one that may give you a little trouble because you might go, okay, it could be one of two things that has like shelly animals. And when I think shelly animals, I think of things like clams, and then this looks like a clam. Uh, so is it a clam or is it a something that's similar to a clam called a brachiopod? And the way you determine is it something like a bivalve or a brachiopod. Bivalves are mollusca, brachiopods are part of phylum brachiopoda, is look at where that hinge is and take a line and does it have equal halves on either side? If the answer is yes, then you definitely have yourself a brachiopod. If not, then you should have yourself what is called a, a bivalve or pelecipod. And pelecipods don't have the same exact look to a bivalve and you can see that in your book as you go through it. All right, get out sample number 10. Like the one you had for sample seven, I want you to compare the holes in it. And the holes is where the answer is. Are they tiny? Are they big? Or are they ones that have individual slots for multiple little, little animals to survive? And I believe they are big. So when you look at that, find something that looks like it in the PDF, and you'll know which particular phylum it is. It's been recrystallized, uh, just like your sample 9 and sample 8 and sample 7 uh, were. So it's definitely that... Uh, recrystallize and it's definitely a body fossil. In a few minutes we'll come back once you get all those looked at, examined, and determine which phylum they belong in and we'll move on into our photos for samples 11 through 25. Welcome back. Put those fossils up and make sure you put this lab with it. So you, after you've scanned it in a course and used it to take your assessment and turned in your lab form, because you're gonna wanna know what these are. Maybe you don't care anything about them. If you don't, that's okay. Uh, I'm sure Environmental Geologic Solutions would be happy to take them back from you. You can look in the inner side of your box, the lid of it for more information on that program if you're interested. All right, we're gonna move into the photos and my job here is to guide you in applying some really good photos 
and you're going to have to identify the phylum. I will help you determine body or trace and help you with the preservation. All right, so you're looking at this underneath the skin, and by the way, this is all skin, so it's a body fossil. This is just sediment that's filled this particular guy up, but the key is it has five-fold symmetry. Look in your identification packet you were given in the lab folder, and there's something that looks just like this. It has, almost looks like a little heart. So very cute. Uh, what phylum is it in? It's body fossil. It's been recrystallized. Okay. Number 12. First of all, can you identify which phylum it's in? Okay. It looks, when you thumb through your PDF, you'll say, yep, I see what this looks like. Now here's the kicker. It's a body or trace. I don't see a shell anywhere on that. Matter of fact, what it is, is if I had a shell that looked like that, like a snail, it filled up with mud and the snail shell broke apart or probably dissolved away. So it's a trace fossil known as a cast to help you out on this one. So no preservation, it's a trace fossil, it's a cast. What phylum does it belong in? All right. Important giveaway. This part right here <laughs> and these right here. That is a important element because vertebrates are all found in one of the phylums that you learned about. This has been preserved as permineralization. It is definitely a body fossil. So what do you have? Moving on to sample 14. All right, you're like, well, big holes, <laughs> kind of. But if you got a really close view and you can even see it in some of these, you can actually see it on the sides better. These are individual cavities where multiple little organisms lived. So it's colonial. So remember, just to kind of give you perspective, one of the three that's similar has really tiny little pinpoint holes. One has bigger holes for filtering water out of the marine environment cleaning it, and then one is like this one that has colonial organisms that make it up. Well, th there's no more of these guys. They're fully extinct, so this is kind of a cool fossil. So it's been uh, recrystallized. It is a body fossil. What phylum does sample 14 belong to? Moving into sample 15. All right, he is related to this thing right here, okay? He is segmented which one of them have segmented bodies and you're like yummy yeah they existed in geologic past too that's all you really need to know about this guy is that he falls in that phylum he is definitely a body fossil i mean you can see it right there and he has been recrystallized so that is a real crab you're not imagining it you're like yeah but that's not its phylum name its phylum name is something different Moving on to sample 16. This just shows you two angles of the same fossil. And can you see where the shelly part of this animal has grown one layer at a time? And this is what the inside of it looks like. So which one do all of the clams fall under? That's what this would be. It's like an oyster, okay? It is recrystallized. It's certainly a body fossil. It can't be anything else. So moving on to 17, to give you an example of what it is, I put one of my toys on the right. These are actually, I actually have several of those uh, little toys right there. And the part you're seeing is this right here, except there's no shell there. Instead, what's happened is mud has filled up the inside of the shell and the shell is either dissolved or broken apart and we're left with a perfect three-dimensional inside piece to that. What do we call that? Uh, obviously, it's not a body fossil. It's a trace fossil. And second, which phylum does that fall under? Okay, it looks like a cinnamon bun. Uh, which one is it? And then you'll know what it is. There is no preservation, okay, because it's, it's not even a body fossil. All right, what are these? <laughs> Well, this little guy right here, Kim, created these right here. 
All right. Well, I wouldn't have expected you to know that. That's why I put a reference point for you as to what he was. These little guys slithered through the mud at the bottom of the ocean and created these right here. So these are trails. They're uh, not even tracks because these don't, guys don't have feet. They actually would have slithered, so they would have made trails. And that's what a trail of this thing looks like. So what phylum has the segmented bodies? Since this is not a body fossil, it's a trace fossil, there is no preservation. So you had this in your box right here. This is what the whole thing looks like, okay? This thing has bifold symmetry, and you'll find the bifold symmetry right in here. Okay, so what's up with that? Which phylum has that name? All of these are marine critters. They were filter feeders, and so this has been recrystallized. What is sample 19? All right, what's that? <laughs> okay, so I need to tell you, looks just like the one I had before, right? Big difference, it's been pressed into the mud instead of representing the mud that's been captured in here. So it'd be like a footprint, but it's not a footprint. In other words, it's an impression. What is that called? Well, now that you know it's this animal, what is the phylum in which that belongs? And I might ask you what's its generic name because there's so many of them that this is one that you should know about. So no preservation because it's a trace fossil, but it is a type of phylum in which we have three majors that we learned about. And this is the cinnamon bun one. When you get to this one, notice the bigger holes. That's designed to help bring in water and filtrate it, and then it sends it back up. These are absolutely the natural cleansers of coral reefs even today. This has been recrystallized. It is a body fossil. The big holes are the key. These are not colonial holes, in other words, they can't be what that particular group is that has colonial animals. These are just the filtration uh, devices that they have. Moving on to sample 22. So getting a, a very close up look at these, it's all of these, okay, and then this right here. These have, and this right here, if you looked at the stems here or the what are called the branches, tiny, tiny, tiny little holes. These are the encrusting time types, and even these holes are super, super tiny. I've zoomed in on this, so it looks a lot bigger than it is. But super tiny little holes that should help you identify what type of fossil phylum it belongs in. It is definitely body, and it's been recrystallized. Moving on to 23. I don't need to tell you this has five-fold symmetry. You can see it yourself, right? Which one of the phylums has that? These are body fossils, they've been recrystallized. So hard to believe starfish have been around this in terms of fossil record, but certainly they have been. 24, all right, this has holes, but they have colonies. So each one of these little cavities has individual, like multiple, probably, you know, 40 to 50 places for different animals to live in this one hole. Same with this, same with this, same with this. So the colonial based animals. What is the phylum name for that? This is totally a body fossil. It's been recrystallized. 25. So there are five of these all the way around. One, two, three, four, five. And it opens up and it's kind of like a little flower. This is a very particular fossil. It's the brother of one that I showed you that had the real pretty flower at the end of it. And like it, it has a little set of stems that go with it. But what phylum is strictly marine and has five-fold symmetry? This is definitely a body fossil and it has been recrystallized. You're like, wow, that looks good. Well, it is absolutely my favorite dish of all times. This is shrimp scampi from the Grand Lux in Las Vegas, Nevada. There is one of these in Dallas at the Galleria. 
And uh, if you're going to get it, man, this it is truly too much for one person to eat. And this bread basket over here, they have some of the absolute best sourdough bread that comes with your meals ever. But I wanted to do this because this would actually fall under arthropods as an example of looking at phylums. So now that you've been through all of your identification labs, what's the takeaway? You should have a better view and knowledge of seeing things in rock layers or if you find one on the ground. You've learned about casual collecting, so you know there's some places you can and can't do that. You can't just go take a rock out of a, a national park or a national monument without a permit just because it has a cool fossil in it or just because you want a trophy or some kind of memento. But when you're looking at like these prawns that are in there, the shrimp scampi, if these would have been buried in a correct way over geologic time, we could easily have them been fossilized, but they would have to be at least 10,000 years old to do it. Remember, you got two chances to take your assessments for this. Turn in that lab form right where it goes, and you will still have 11 more, or at least labs 11 through 20 to do for the remainder of the semester. You just don't need your rock box. So starting any time after this lab till the the week right before finals, you can contact Environmental Geologic Solutions if you like to uh, do the Rock Kit buyback program should you be interested. Thank you so much for your time. I'm so proud of you for making it all the way through fossils, through metamorphic, sedimentary igneous, and minerals all the way back at the beginning. Hard to believe you've done them all, right? It means you're halfway through the semester. Now, FYI, you have a lab exam coming up, and all of the identification labs are there. And there's a study guide in the exams folder, and it's a pictorial one. It's super helpful. As I mentioned in the course orientation or, or overview video, that's a great place to have gone to get information for all of these labs, and I hope you use that. Thanks so much. Take care and stick with it. Bye.